Chelsea Kabakas is one of the leading sports presenters in the industry today. In this episode, Chelsea discusses some of the challenges she's faced as being a female footballer. They made my life living hell. I mean, the whole process, I even got like my visa to go and last minute, literally, I want to say four days before, they gave me the news that I wasn't going. She also goes into detail how she meant to play football with the Galactico around the green side. I was like, let me do this. And I like put the ball down and everyone was like, what the hell? And she also goes into detail how Raul, yes, that's right, the Real Madrid Raul, uh, played a massive part in her presenting career that it is today. I actually announced oh. Raul's retirement. I was oh. like, what? <laughs> Shout out to our sponsors of today's episode, Trap Boy. Thanks for sending me through this t-shirt. It's a really cool design. I think a lot of you will like that sort of stuff that they're putting out recently. So I've made sure that all the information how to check out Trap Boy's latest stuff is in the video description. Make sure you go check that out and give them a follow on Instagram as well. They're always putting out new, really good stuff. So thanks again for sponsoring the show. Before we start, make sure you like, comment and subscribe. And I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome back everybody to Monadina Talks. Today we have an excellent guest with us. We've got Chelsea Kabakas. Uh, Chelsea, how are you doing? Thank you so much for coming on. I am great. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm, I'm back in New York, which I'm excited because I'm, I'm back with family. Um, unfortunately, I had to leave you guys before. I had a little family emergency, but I mean, helps that I'm around family. So it's always a great thing. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, Zara, how have you been the last week or so since our last yeah, episode? I'm okay, thank you. I'm so excited to have you on today, Chelsea. And yeah, thanks for giving your time and coming no, on. No, thank you so, guys so much for having me. This is like so exciting. Usually I'm the one that's like interviewing people. Yeah. <laughs> so this is exciting. <laughs> You'll have to let us know how it is to be on the receiving end of it at the end. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let you guys know. <laughs> Yeah, so just to start with then, so if people haven't heard about you or what you do, I know you do a lot of things at the moment, so would you like to tell us briefly what you're up to at the moment? Yeah, so right now I'm really kind of focusing on my broadcasting um, career. Yeah. I started off, well, you don't know me, uh, I was a professional football player and I have been through a lot of adversity and obstacles with my injuries, but I had it very clear on what I wanted to do since the beginning on the side, the side soccer, just because I know that's not a career that lasts for so long. And because I'm a female, we honestly just don't get paid the same as men. So we always kind of have to have something on the side. But for as long as I could remember, I've always wanted to be a soccer player since I was three years old, it's in all my yearbooks. Um, but I also wanted to be in front of the camera. I don't know what it was. <laughs> it was like, I would just perform in my house in front of everyone, which is really weird because um, I'm an introvert. I'm an only child. So okay. in front of the camera, I like my personal, my personality comes out. But when I'm in front of a group, I am very reserved and very quiet. Unless you piss oh. me off, then it's a little different. But um, <laughs> other than that, <laughs> yeah. So just right now I'm really focusing on uh, my broadcasting career in Colombia. Uh, just because I decided to stay there just because it's um, in Spanish, obviously, Spanish speaking country. Mm -hmm. I am not the greatest at speaking Spanish, but you guys should know. I mean, everyone should know the more languages you speak um, in a career that you have more to your advantage. So yeah. I always receive a lot of work in Spanish and I just never really had the confidence to take that on. So I decided I was like, you know what? I love throwing myself out there in uncomfortable situations. And I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead, work in Colombia for six, six months to a year, make myself extremely uncomfortable, and then move back to the States or Europe where I can work in a bigger market. Mm. So that's the long-term goal. <laughs> sounds yeah, like a good girl. <laughs> yeah, Spanish sounds really good from what I've heard of it and your accent. So maybe it's not that interesting. <laughs> Well, I have to it's, speak Spanish, so I don't know what I compare it to. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I feel way more comfortable speaking English than I do Spanish. Spanish was my, yeah. first, was my first language okay. up until I was about like five, six years old. And yeah. I've always lived in New York my entire life. Um, yeah. I'm the first generation. But then one day I came back home from school and I was like, uh, we're in America. 
why the hell am I speaking Spanish? <laughs> Just because I was getting made fun of in school, you know, um, because I, I didn't speak English as well. So I, from that point on, I just decided not to speak Spanish. <laughs> and that completely screwed me over in the long run. Yeah. Oh, so do you, yeah. do you feel like that had an impact on you speaking Spanish then, being bullied at school for your accent? In the beginning, yeah, I used to get bullied all the time for everything. Like if it wasn't my hair, it mm. was something else. Like they used to call me George Bush or Broccoli oh, Head no. because my curls, like obviously the fro, like now I embrace my fro. I love my fro. Yeah. Like, can I curse on this? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm like, I'm now I'm just like, bitch, I'm better than all of y'all. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I, um, I think your hair is amazing. I was, like, I was like, mom, I was like, straighten my hair. <laughs> but yeah, she used to like put it up here and it used to like on top of my head. So it would look like it would fall like a little like tree. <laughs> so it would call me broccoli head. And then with my Spanish, like it was just really annoying. <laughs> so it, it was tough, but then I kind of developed thick skin as well. Cause yeah. I've always, I've always been, um, I've always had kind of a temper on me. Like once you get me upset, like, <laughs> It's on. <laughs> so that helped. But my feelings were hurt. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. But FYI, I think your hair is amazing. So yeah. well, for now those of I you who don't it. know what Chelsea's hair looks like, go on to her Instagram and have a look. Oh, there'll be a picture of her <laughs> on so if you want to see. Yeah, now now I embrace my hair. I don't even straighten my hair. I haven't straightened my hair in like years. I don't even know what that oh, I was actually yeah. thinking about that the other day. I was like, I should straighten my hair. I was like, nah, it takes too long. It takes too long. It takes too long. Sorry, I hate going to the salon. So, yeah. So, what are you? What are you up to at the moment? So, what are you doing in your career right now? So, right now, I'm working with Junior FC. It's a team in Colombia, based in Barranquilla, and I am basically their host. So, I go to games, I do previews, I host interviews, I also produce as well, just because I have realized with my experience, before I got in front of the camera, I was very adamant about learning absolutely every single position. So, I went from um, camera girl to audio to producer to then graduating in front of the camera, right? Okay. Um, and that has enabled me to, while I've been like traveling the world and getting these jobs and stuff like that, it also has helped me kind of produce, you know, and help companies or help, um, brands build yeah. new content, you know? So I originally got, sorry, I originally got hired as a host, but me being me, I was like, you know what? <laughs> I was like, I want to take, I want to take over. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm also producing. Um, I'm trying to be, being that it's a third world country, they're, they're a bit behind, right. With marketing, with, um, content, et cetera. So I'm trying to push the button to see if I can just like kind of throw new ideas out there, create new content to see how people are going to react and how the brand, how the team is going to react. Right. Um, yeah. so that's kind of my current project while I'm hosting as well, building my, my portfolio, well, my demo. Okay, sounds, sounds amazing and like a lot of work. <laughs> it is. I, I've had a mini breakdown the other day. Actually, now that I'm talking about it, I'm like, wow, that's a lot. And yeah. the other day I was, I was like, kind of have, I was freaking out because I was like, I'm not doing enough. I'm just such a perfectionist where mm. I really spread myself out and I get into like a thousand different projects yeah. and I feel like I'm still not doing anything right because these well, these type of jobs, right? They're not very rewarding until, mm -hmm. like, until like the long term. The short term, not so much, mm -hmm. unless you're like, a, let's say, I don't know, like a famous, I don't know, Gigi Hadid, or you, you get what I'm saying, where it's like yeah. there's a lot of money invested from, this, from the start, from the get go. So obviously, mm -hmm. the marketing is different, et cetera. So it's like you're building from the ground up, but then again, it's rewarding long term, you know? So you just have to learn how to be patient with the process. Yeah. Yeah, wow. So if we start from like the beginning of your journey then, how did you first gain an interest in sports and football growing up? How did it come about? Um, I started playing at the age of three. As yeah. I had mentioned earlier, I am an only child. 
So I was very, very close to my parents. With that being mm. said, extremely close to my dad. And um, during that time, my parents were kind of going through a divorce, separation. It was like back and forth. So my dad would kind of take the initiative to take me to soccer practice. That was our way of bonding. Or he would take me to the park with him because he's Spanish, like he's Colombian. And football is a dominant sport in Colombia. So yeah. at that time, my dad was still young and he would go to the park on Saturdays where there was like a local league and he would play. And I was the only girl. So I would go with him. I was like four or five years old and I would follow my dad everywhere. And he would take me with him. And I had no, <laughs> I had nothing else to do, but sit there, you know, another lady would babysit me and there'll be like kids running around everywhere. There'll be like, you know, music and everyone's sitting down. It's like a, it's just a big park, right? If you guys ever come to yeah. you have to go to that park. Yeah. Um, to get kind of the idea of the environment. <laughs> um, and I was always the only girl. So I, one day I just got up and I was like, I want to play too. And it was a bunch of boys. So that's how I started playing. And I just, yeah, I don't know. My dad just kind of just threw me in it. And ever since then, that's, that's been my thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. So how did it go from there? Did you start playing for more local teams and then it grew from there? Yes. So from there, I started playing with boys. I played with boys up until I was 12. Okay. Uh, my dad, yeah, my dad ended up being my coach, my first coach. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because also I'm extremely girly. I'm very feminine. So yeah. as much as I wanted to be a tomboy, like I could, I could do both things. But at the mm -hmm. same time, I was very easily distracted, right? And at that age, five, six years old, seven, you have days where you don't want to go to practice or you don't want to do something, you know? Yeah. So yeah. my dad has a really funny story of me and my dad has a very bad temper. Like he's like, you know, yelling and very like rough and like, <laughs> so one day I was on the field and my dad's coaching and I bend down in the middle of a game and I sit down next to a flower and I start playing with a little flower. In the oh. <laughs> and my dad's <laughs> bugging out on the sideline like, show me. <laughs> Where's all the sport? I'm just sitting there like with the flower. <laughs> like, look at the flower. Oh, wow. So, um, so yeah, so it's like, it was kind of like a process, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And then it got really serious. Like it got really serious at the age of eight, nine, where they realized where, where they realized, all right, she's good. You know, um, I would train every day. Then it got extremely serious around 11, 12, where I was ahead. You know, I was ahead of, I was, a, I was ahead of the girls, you know, um, they put me in a girls team and I was always like the best one or the most skillful one. Mm -hmm. And then that's when they were like, all right, um, we're, this is going to be her thing. You know, like this is, we know, she's going to go pro. You kind of know. Um, you kind of know by like the age of nine or 10, if the kid's going to be good, like the kid's going to yeah. go to college or the kid's going to, if he, like he has a gift or he or she has a gift. Mm. So I fortunately did have a gift. Um, and that's when I started my journey. Although it was difficult for me because like I said, I come from a first, like I'm the first generation. Mm. So I didn't have as much support as the other girls did. My parents were always there for me when they could. And my dad would always be there. But the thing is, there are little things, you know, when you get signed into an academy, there are little things that parents need to do to give you that extra push where it's like they need to talk to coaches. They need to play the political game, you know? Yeah. Um, and I never really had that because either my dad had to work or my mom had to work or, you know, it was, it was always kind of in the limbo, you know? Yeah. That's really interesting. I want. I was wondering, do you think you would have gone into football if it wasn't for your dad pushing you? Uh, do you think that you would have gone into a different industry or, a, or yeah, do you have any other interests? I really, I really don't know anything else, you know? Yeah. And like sometimes I, that. Yeah. I really don't know anything else. My mom, my mom was a kickboxer a boxer okay. and yeah so both my parents are athletes um my mom's extremely competitive and she's really good at the sport it's just uh she got badly injured towards the end and that just kind of she decided to retire okay. but um I didn't really know anything else I loved dancing you know I tried they put me in dancing I think that lasted like a week <laughs> from what I remember 
And they also tried boxing and that didn't last very long either. <laughs> I won one trophy <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> All I remember is that that was, that, was, that was the end of it. So I don't really know anything else, you know? I, I don't know if I would have chosen something. I don't even know where I would be. Yeah. Good question. <laughs> Yeah, so um, so I'm quite intrigued then because obviously there's a lot of players that like we have a lot in um, England over here with our academies that there's a lot of players with a lot of talent. Ravel Morrison comes to mind that they don't actually make that next step that fulfills their talent. And I know you represented Colombia at the Olympics. So what was kind of the transition from, you know, you have a lot of talent to actually making the Olympic squad and getting it that far with your career? So... Um... That was definitely, that's kind of like when the injury started, you know, um, it was very, it was very difficult for me. Yeah. It was, it was a, how do I explain it? It was a great stage in my life, mm. but at the same time, it was, a, it was a hard one, you know, um, the culture shock, going to Columbia, uh, they weren't very welcoming at all. I'm not, okay. I'm not going to you guys, like I'm already out of the sport, so I don't have to play the political game anymore. They were yeah. terrible. And... <laughs> They made my life living hell in the beginning. <laughs> um, some girls, yeah, some girls were very welcoming because they didn't really feel threatened. You know, they were very confident in their own skills and they were just there to to compete and do what they had to do. But other other girls, they just they were spiteful, you know, and it's part of the culture and it's, and it's normal. But it was it was hard for me because I'm not like that. You know, I'm a team player. I yeah. guess that's something where I've always struggled. Um, where I am, I'm very selfless, you know, mm -hmm. I want everyone to win. And yeah. I believe like, if you're better than me, then you know what, you should win. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna try putting you down or making your life living hell. But yeah. anyways, um, during that point, it was, it was rewarding as well, because I worked my ass off, you know, um, I worked my ass off to get there. And I got calls back for the, for the Olympics. Mm -hmm. I was on the roster. I made the whole process. I even got like my visa to go and last mm -hmm. minute, literally, I want to say four days before they gave me the news that I wasn't going. Oh, so that's... I was the last one cut. Yeah, I was the last one cut, but I was like on like reserved apparently. Like, I mean, I don't know, like if one of the other reserves would have gotten hurt, then like they would have called me in, you know? Yeah. Uh, but fortunately for them, I mean, that didn't happen. You no. Know? Um, but that was, that was definitely a very hard pill to swallow just yeah. because I spent so much time preparing, you know, and getting ready and you're in the public eye. So yeah. that's also what people don't take into account where you also are put in a very vulnerable situation mm -hmm. where it's not only do you feel like you failed, but you're failing in front of people, you know? in yeah. front of others and that that was that was definitely definitely very difficult um but I also had to understand that I also had to understand that it wasn't me you know it was something that wasn't in my control and um maybe in the future I'll be able to speak on it but other things were played into into account and that's the reason why I I didn't get chosen you know okay so um unlike not completely being accepted is that do you think that's partly because you were from America, born and brought up, and then you were playing for the Columbia team? Do you think that played a part in it? No, um, I think what played a part in it was, uh, how do I explain it? I just wasn't in the in the group, you know, like I wasn't oh. like favorite, you know, it, there's always in large groups like that in teams, there's always players that are preferred because of yeah. um, individual preference. You know, every coach is very different. Every coach has their style of play. Every coach, you know, it depends. Now it, now it's also their job to be fair, you know, um, to be fair with the decisions that they make where it's like, okay, you're taking a player because they're better than the other player because they have the yeah. abilities to, to show. You know, you're not taking the other players because, I don't know, they're giving you money under the table, maybe, <laughs> you know, um, other stuff that are in the account, things like that. Okay. Yeah. So I know that must have been like a tough pill to swallow when all that's going on. How did you manage to like kind of recover from that and realize you wanted to move away from that and go into the more media side of it? 
So I've always been the type to keep my mouth shut about everything. I never spoke up. I never, I, that was what, 2015. Um, yeah. I, have been playing up until 2021, you know, just until mm. up until recently. And this is the first time ever that I'm speaking up about it, about the things that were done to me and like the injustice of, of like the sport, which is sad yeah. because um, I've always said, I'm like, you know what, when I'm in the place, um, when I'm in the correct place, the place and timing, like I'm going to go ahead and speak up because this is unfair. And like, I don't want this to happen to other, yeah. to other players, yeah. to other girls, you know, where yeah. I, like, I'm very honest. I will say that I'm very straightforward and I've always been very hard on myself. So when I'm not at the level, I say it, I'm not, you know, and I'm such a perfectionist where it's like, even when I'm at my best, I'm like, I need to be better. I need yeah. to, try more. I need to lift more. I'm not strong enough. Like I'm always putting myself down in a way. So mm. like me to say I was ready. Like that means like, that means something, you know? Yeah. Uh, and like, I kind of just kept my mouth shut and I just, I kept working and I, I, I was just like, you know what? I can't control that. Uh, I got to control the controllable. That's what I would always say. And yeah. I always said, I was like, you know what? My day is going to come. I was like, maybe I'm, I'm very spiritual. I'm a religious person. I'm a Catholic. So I'm yeah. like, God, God has his ways, you know, um, another door is going to open for me. So with that illusion and like that dream, um, I always, I always said, I was like, you know what? It's fine. Like my day is going to come. I just kept going and going. And then I also just really focused in media as well, you know, on the side. Yeah. Because it was a passion of mine. And because I was, I was actually good at it. <laughs> like, you know, it was the first thing that I will say that I didn't feel so much pressure the way I felt with football. Um, football felt like a job. Uh, broadcasting for me just kind of came very natural. And, um, and it's like the first thing that I can say, like, I have confidence in, you know, with football, I was always, there was always that slight insecurity, but with broadcasting, it was like, I'm good. Like, I know this game. Like I can read this game from like the top of my head, you know, I can keep my eyes closed and I can read and I can see what's going on, you know? Yeah. Um, and not everyone has that gift where they can read a game. Like, yeah, everyone can host. There's a bunch of great hosts out there, but I also realized like I had a gift because I had an ex-boyfriend very very good coach and he was working for Rome at that time um the guy's gifted like the guy is way ahead of his time and he would have to analyze matches right and I would sometimes sit there with him and just kind of me just sitting there just watching what he's doing and bored out of my mind I'm like dude I'm like don't you see what's going on like this player's out here and this player, and he, he would just look at me. He's like, are you kidding me? Like, I've been sitting here for 20 minutes trying to figure this out. And he's like, you didn't say anything. I'm like, well, it's common sense. And then that's when I realized, you know, like I have a gift for reading the game, you know, like that's something that I'm good at. So that's where I was like, okay, I'm going to be an analyst. <laughs> that sounds amazing. And you, it sounds like you really talk from your heart as well. So you're, you're really natural at talking and the confidence really shows, even, even in this podcast, it is showing, definitely. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I'm actually really talking to you guys caught me on a good day. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually just saying, I'm like, I'm talking too much. <laughs> no, please go ahead. Please talk. The more you talk, the better. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned about being uh so obviously a lot of things have been going around about how it's harder for women in sport as well i think you touched on that that was a bit more difficult and you started playing originally when you were younger playing with boys do you feel like there's not enough um opportunity to give given to women in the media as well or do you think it's getting better as time's going i think it's getting way better um i think it's getting way better I think now there's a lot of women in sports that are very knowledgeable and empowering. Yeah. Uh, there's some that I follow, Rebecca Lowe, um, who else? Uh, Carissa Thompson. I love Carissa Thompson, but she's in the NFL. Yeah. But there's a lot of women in sports that are now powerful in front of the camera. Uh, I think behind the camera, there isn't enough women in production yeah. or okay. at least in sports. I don't know about entertainment. I think entertainment, there's a bit more. But yeah. behind the camera, there isn't as much diversity or um, women. From my from my personal experience, I don't know, uh, and it's tough. 
you want to know why? Because we're in, we're, I'm going to be very honest with you. We're in a man's world. You know, uh, mm. we are catering to men. Very, very few women will turn on the TV and put on NBC in the morning to watch a premiere game or watch shit. I'm one of them. Like, I'm like, oh, I want to watch E! News <laughs> or the cooking channel, you know, like <laughs> very few. So we're catering to men, um, which also makes it difficult, though, because when you're starting off, it's a man's world and they're very, very tough on you. You get criti- you get critiqued very, very hard, you know? Um, you have to know what you're talking about, which is great because I'm a firm believer. You shouldn't just be a pretty face. I've always said that. Like, yeah. if you're a woman, you have to be way more prepared than anyone else in that room. And you have to know what you're talking about and your questions need to be on point. So... So yeah, sorry, my dad's coming in this room and he might be yelling. He has no idea of it his house. So if he does come in yelling, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, but there should there should be more women like behind the camera and behind like, you know, production just so it can be a little bit more welcoming because yeah. I've had some bad experiences, let me tell you. <laughs> starting off now, I don't, now I just, you know, I kind of, I kind of just brush it off. But starting off, I had a I had a producer. He was he was terrible. He was definitely sexist. Like there was no doubt about it. <laughs> yeah. And do you think for racism, is it the same that's getting better, or do you find that's not making as much progress as it should be? You know what? Um, I was actually having this conversation the other day, and people might people might go against me on this. Yeah. But I think it's kind of annoying now where they're just like forcing diversity on you. And I understand I'm all for it because I'm Latina, but now yeah. it's just like, they're just doing it for the wrong reasons. You know, okay. do, you, do you get what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. Because there's a movement and that's awesome. It's great. And most probably they're going to be like, well, what else do you want? You know, like, well, we're doing that. But I'm okay. like, now it's just like, you're just forcing it and you're just doing it because you want more views or you want more support. Like it's not genuinely coming out of your heart where it's like, yeah. you know what, this person is good. You know, this person, I just, I always just say, I'm like, yo, may, may the best person get the job. Like that, I don't, I don't care what color you are. I don't care what color eyes you have. I don't care, but let it be because you're very good. Not because of the color of your skin. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's a great point then, yeah. Uh, would you would you be able to tell us a little bit about the shows and content that you report for at the moment? Um, yeah, so basically it's just uh, previews before matches where yeah. I talk about what, what the match is going to hold, what's going to happen. And then after the matches, I'll give like an analyst report um, and then just interviews, just basic interviews. Nothing really fun at the moment. <laughs> Nothing really extravagant. <laughs> but I'm trying. I'm trying to create like my own content. Yeah. On on the side. I was gonna ask, do you enjoy doing it? Um, like this job or? Yeah. I do. I like it. <laughs> I like it. I just. I think right now, I'm at a point where. I want to be pushed, you know? Yeah. And yeah. I think I, I've been doing kind of the same thing for so long where I started off and I'm like, all right, I've been doing previews and since I was 20 years old. Like I want to do something else. I want to do more in studio work or I want mm-hmm. to be doing on the field and doing like a live report. What I used, I used to do that. But um, right now, like being that I'm doing like the whole Spanish thing, I'm kind of starting from one, you know? Yeah. 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 And uh, could you tell us a bit about who are like the big names you've managed to interview over the years? Um, I have interviewed Roberto Carlos, uh, David Villa, um, Raul. I actually announced oh. Raul's retirement. Which Raul Madrid, Raul. Was, yeah, oh, that wow. was my first, first big, big interview. And he actually said, he was like, listen, I want you... Um, to announce my retirement. I was oh. like, what? <laughs> I, at that time, I was working with him at Cosmos because he retired at Cosmos. Yeah. And he had mentioned, he was like, I want you to, to announce it, you know, to basically do the interview that's going to go worldwide because I don't feel like doing a thousand interviews with a thousand people. So the questions that you're going to ask me are, it's the interview that's going to be put out to a bunch of like, oh, wow. I was 
thing myself. Let me tell you, <laughs> I had, I was like 20 years old, I think. Yeah. I was like 20 oh, and I was wow. like, Oh my God. I was like, this guy wants me to interview. Yeah, it doesn't get bigger than that. Does it? Wow. I have pictures of that day. I, you can't hear my voice, but all the questions are me. So I'm yeah. the one that like organized it. That, that was really cool. Um, I've done Marco Senna. I've done Ida Johnson. I've done Aaron, oh, wow. Aaron Risa. I've done a bunch. Like that's just to name to name a few. And yeah, well, I really don't remember <laughs> some of them. I'm really bad. I have like a really bad memory. I'm like, oh yeah, I did I put in every that person. <laughs> now, I'm really intrigued about Raul. So how you've obviously met him and know him to like a good extent. How is it he? Was insane. So it was funny because when we first met, I didn't really know. It's not that I didn't know who he was. I I obviously yeah. didn't know who he was, but I've never been the person to be extremely starstruck like starstruck okay. like I'm just not like I I look at them and I'm like hey and at yeah. that time I was still playing like I was really into like my playing so yes. dad that's very uncomfortable <laughs> he like stand over there <laughs> my dad's like standing <laughs> over the camera <laughs> so um so he ended up just being extremely nice very humble um yeah. he, and he would see me practice by myself after my interviews like I would finish I'd finish working and I'd go onto the field and I'd start, I'd start practicing. So he would see like the hunger and he actually offered, he was like, listen, he's like, I can help you in this process. I can get you in contact with, oh, wow. uh, with an agent wow. or whatever. And he like got me in contact with an agent and like he, every player, like every player that I came across, I have definitely like built some type of relationship, you know, and he, he was, he was an amazing person. And I think being in the public eye, like how he was, it was very uncomfortable for him. So that's why he didn't like doing interviews because it's annoying. Like you literally walk out and people are on top of you. You go to eat, people are on top of you. Like people don't understand like, yes, it's cool. But fame really isn't that cool when you're going through like a low point in your life because yeah. it's uncomfortable. You're yeah. very vulnerable at that moment. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you also mentioned David Villa and you mentioned one other person. Who was it that you first said that you interviewed? Um. Roberto Carlos, Roberto Carlos, um, Roberto. Sergio Ramos. I did Sergio Ramos. I did like oh, really? half the Real Madrid team. Oh, okay. Which is really oh. cool. I actually beat them in soccer, soccer golf, which is really funny. Did you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had heels on and I like, and they were playing against like the other players. Yeah. And one thing I will say, well, at that time I had like a really good um, shot. Like my shot has always been really good. It's been very accurate. Yeah. Dude, all these guys were like missing. <laughs> like they had no idea I played. So I like took off my heel and I was like, you know what? I was like, you guys suck. I was like, let me do this. And I like put the ball down and everyone was like, what the hell? <laughs> so it was, it was actually oh. really funny. Yeah. I was, that was on the Real Madrid training ground as well. Yes, it was. Oh, it, was wow. um, it was when they were, they were, when they were here in New York, uh, they were doing, they were doing the international tour. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Was that, that was around the Galactico era then, was it? Yes. Yeah, so go on. How was Sergio Ramos then? Because he looks like a big personality when he's on the pitch. How is he off the pitch? He's, 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 he's great. He's a great person. Um, very humble, very sweet. You know, we exchange a few words. Yeah. Uh, he's very cooperative. What I have realized is that, and I will say this publicly with no shame, yeah. players that are extremely famous and players that are extremely up there are the most humble, cooperative people okay. you will ever work with and the person that has absolutely no type of fame close to them <laughs> has to be like the most difficult person to work with it's always like that I don't know what it is I don't I, it's like it's like you ask them hey can I get an interview or hey can I well you know I don't want you to ask I just look at them I'm like bro like I'm giving you a closure like just shut up and do the interview <laughs> like you're not that important that's what I want to say sometimes you're not that important <laughs> I'm doing this because it's my job <laughs> yeah was there any other the Real Madrid players that like stood out in terms of anything they did or any stories you have of them um no they were very they were very reserved because uh, yeah very professional because they were kind of on a, on a schedule yeah you know? um so i didn't i didn't get to like interact with them like that just do the quick interviews and stuff like that and, and that's it yeah. but uh the one that really did like did stand out was sergio ramos because i i mainly did do the interview with him yeah 
Oh, yeah. So how did you manage to build your name so much at the age of 20 that um, the likes of like Raul knew who you were and wanted to announce his retirement? So that was my first job with the Cosmos. So I didn't even have a name yet at all. Oh, okay. um, like at all. It was just, that was my first job. Um, mm -hmm. So that started and then I started just like kind of putting out my own content. And at that moment I got hurt, I got injured. So I also started publicizing, public, publishing, 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 <laughs> publishing. I sometimes get like mixed up with Spanish. It's really bad. It's <laughs> um, I started publishing my own content of like my comeback. And yeah. that's where I started making a name for myself because people realized they were like, oh, wow, she's doing this and she's also recovering. That's awesome, you know? And then my story also like impacted a lot of people. So that's kind of how I built up, you know, my journey. I've always been very big with being transparent and being very honest with everyone because my goal since the beginning when I started this was to influence people, not just like a regular influencer on Instagram. Yeah. No, my goal has always been like literally since day one was I want my story or my journey to touch someone that they think that they can't make it somewhere. And because they see my story, they see me, they believe in themselves, you know, just yeah. because I always kind of searched for that person where I needed motivation. So yeah. That's why like, I'm so against like influencers on Instagram. They really me off <laughs> because I just feel like it's very, it's, it's very fake. It's not, it's not yeah. organic and it doesn't come from yeah. the heart. So, um, it just, it, it really just rubs me the wrong way <laughs> where I'm just like, you're human. Like you need to show that you're human as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So can you tell us um, who were your role models when you were growing up? Um, as in where in football or, or hosting? Uh, both so maybe. yeah, both. Okay. Um, in football, one of my role models was Carly Lloyd from the U S she just, she just retired. Um, it's a player that I like really loved her story and just how she is. Um, and then as a host, Kelly Ripa, I love Kelly Ripa. Mm -hmm. I'm morning America. <laughs> um, obsessed. <laughs> Those are the two people. And Oprah loved Oprah. Um, I'm a very big Oprah fan. I listen yeah. to all her podcast, her vibes, just, just everything about her is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's probably a lot of people's heroes growing up as well. Um, yeah, I love like, I just, I, I love her. I love how she does yeah. interviews. I love how she helps the community. She helps everyone. And not for nothing, interviewing people, it's, it's difficult. It's not easy. She yeah. makes it look so easy and effortless. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And do you have any future goals that say next 10, 15 years from now, where would you see yourself? Yes, I do. Um, I would really love to write a book at some point. Yeah. It's oh, okay. It's been one of my goals. Yeah. Uh, I want to be on NBC, on yeah. NBC for um, the Premier League in the mornings mm. on Saturdays. Yeah. Sorry, hello. <laughs> Coming for your job. Um, <laughs> that's, that's one of my goals. I, I really want to be in studio. It doesn't necessarily have to be with NBC, but I want to be yeah. on with a big network in studio, uh, write my own book and possibly create like my own content, traveling the world, trying new foods, interviewing influential people. Uh, doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be someone famous. It's just someone in the community that has done something that can uh, teach me a little bit about like their views. You know, I'm a very big traveler. Oh, someone else I loved and I looked up to and I cried when this yeah. person passed away, Anthony Bourdain. Oh, okay. oh, I was obsessed with Andy Bourdain as a journalist. Yeah. He was incredible. He is incredible. He was, is, still is <laughs> till this day. So uh, he actually was one of the reasons why I decided to take on journalism and broadcasting. Okay. Yeah, the legacy lives on, <laughs> isn't it? What, what was it like being an in-house host for um, New York City uh, Football Club? It was 
nerve wracking. Why? Because I have never hosted in a stadium. It's extremely different um, because you're hearing your voice and you're in front of thousands or hundreds of people and you're on the big screen. And as much as you think it's not nerve wracking, it's extremely nerve wracking because you're hearing your voice and you have to remember your lines, right? Because you have to hit um, the sponsors because people are paying to get their names out on this loud yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so it's really funny because I went blank, literally blank one time. Like okay. I completely forgot my line. I actually have a video of that <laughs> where I was like, uh, <laughs> yeah, come to section 302. <laughs> completely went blank. So it, it was nerve wracking. But then once I, once I got the hang of it, it was, it was cool. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned that you also worked on radio. What would you say the main differences have been for yourself working on radio compared to TV? Um, believe it or not, radio is way more difficult than television for me. Yeah. Because on radio, you have to paint the picture for people that aren't seeing you. That's true, yeah. When you're in front of the camera, you can kind of kill time by giving somewhat uh, expressions or you can kill time by doing like a movement. On radio, yeah. you're on for a certain time for 30 seconds and you have to paint the picture in those 30 seconds and you have to keep them intrigued because not they change the station and that is less views and that's less money for the station yeah and that's not your job so for me radio is way more difficult um but if you can conquer radio you yeah. can obviously conquer television if you're not scared of being in front of the camera yeah okay. uh, it's it's a gift yeah yeah i know that that's good insight into that I think it's really um, interesting um, you, you're also a model so like how did you get into modeling so it's um it's actually a really funny story <laughs> um this goes into me being very stubborn and strong like willed so so it's, as long as I can remember like I said I've always wanted to be in front of the screen and I was always like walk a runway in my house when I was a kid I would put on shows it was I was a wreck um <laughs> At that time, I think 2015, 2016, I always saw Sport Illustrated models and it's something that I've always kind of wanted to be in front of. I was like, wow, I want to do that. I want to be a model. Like I want to, but at the same time, that's a career. It's, it's difficult. Yeah. So um, at that moment, I was just like, I can conquer anything. <laughs> so obviously you're in New York um, and there's a lot of agencies. That time I was dating someone and I brought it up to him. I was like, hey, listen, like, I want to, I want to see if I can go to an agency and I want to, and I'm going to get picked up. You know, what? you guys want to know what he said to me <laughs> because he was very insecure with himself. Um, yeah. he was like, you're not going to get picked up by an agency. Like oh. you're not a model. And he was like, don't you see the models? Like we're in New York city. Like you see them all the time. So he's like, you have to be tall and skinny. And I was like, no, I was like, I think I'll get picked up. So I put a portfolio together of all my pictures. I literally got a photographer and I was like, hey, take pictures of me. And now that I look back at those photos, they were terrible, terrible <laughs> to tell you. But I put together like a portfolio with the best of my ability. I used YouTube and Google to find out what were the pictures that I needed. Yeah. I walked into Wilhelmina. There was a line. There was literally, I think that day was a casting, it was an open casting. Yeah. And the line around the block with like tall, <laughs> skinny, very skinny models, very anorexic looking. And I walked into like, and I like went to the, to the beginning of the line. I was like, Hey, I was like, I'm here for the casting. Um, but I'm an athlete. I kind of threw that in. I was like, I'm an athlete. Yeah. I looked at me. He was like, hold on, let me bring you upstairs. So he let, let me cut the whole line. I went in. Um, and Topher at that time was Topher. He was Mulamina. He looked at me, he was like, listen, you have a lot of potential. He was like, but he was like, I need you to take more photos. So I was like, okay, fine. He didn't sign me. He was like, come back with your photos. He was like, you have potential. And that's Wilhelmina guys. Wilhelmina is Wilhelmina. <laughs> um, <laughs> I walked out and I went to another agency. I don't know. I went on, on Instagram and I saw that state was, so I walked to state and I, it said that they had an open casting for fittings. I thought fittings were like, I thought it was something else. I didn't know anything about fashion, like the fashion world. Yeah. So I walked in and I'm like seeing all these like thicker girls. And I'm like, well, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, something is up. So I'm like waiting on the line and some lady sees me and she's like, are you here for the casting, for the fitting casting? And I'm like, 
I'm super casting. I was like, I'm just <laughs> <I'm> like Romeo. <laughs> and the lady's like, wait a second. She's like, you're too cute. Like this is just, I remember exactly what she said. She's dressed in all black and she was very chic. She's like, you look too cute. She's like, come with me. <laughs> so she took me to like the other office and they sat me in a room and they took my measurements and they were like, let's sign you. Like we're good. We want to start working with you. And that's how I became a model. Oh, and, I got right. to <laughs> and I came back. I remember I went to this guy and I was like, I'm a model. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's a great story that is. Yeah. Yeah. Well done you. Yeah. Yeah. No, proving everyone wrong. Yeah. yeah. Um, I actually, I wanted to ask a quick question as well. Um, so we know that you interview other people. So what is it like being on the receiving end of the interview today? How has it been? Um, being on the receiving end, is, it's, it's cool, you know? It feels like you've actually done something that people are watching. Uh, because usually I, I kind of feel like I'm doing everything wrong, you know? And I'm like, well, why the hell would people want to look up to me? Or why the hell would they want to hear my life story, you know? I don't even have it together. <laughs> I don't even know what I'm going to do in two hours. <laughs> um, but it's, 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 it's cool, you know, to know that people are watching and I can somewhat touch someone, you know, touch someone's heart or someone's brain or just influence them in some type of way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah so we've got a final two questions that it's kind of tradition okay. on our show that we asked the guests this. So the first one of these is what does the word success mean to you? The word success means being internally happy, being at peace where being at peace with where you are in life. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think that's what success means to me because the the material stuff that comes right, um, the house, the cars, nobody wants cars. Like you're not gonna bullshit me and say you wouldn't like want a nice car. Um, but I think success really just comes in from like internally, yeah. and uh, I think that's that's where I want to be. Yeah, no, that's really interesting because the second question was, what does the word happiness mean to you? But it kind of seems they're intertwined with each other for you, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> Happiness to me is just being happy with myself, you know, being okay with where I am in my life. Yeah. Um, having my parents and my family around me and kind of understanding that, uh, how do I explain it? Just understanding that you're never, not everything's ever going to be perfect. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So you just have a final session called Rapid Fire Questions, it's just 10. Ten questions, answer them as fast as you can. Okay. So, uh, so your favorite city in the world? Uh, uh, <laughs> Rome. Rome. Uh, oh, no, wait, 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 I take that back. Barcelona. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, Messi or Ronaldo? Messi. Food or sleep? What? Food or sleep? Food or sleep, is that what you said? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sleeping. Uh, <laughs> uh, favorite subject at school? Language. Uh, describe New York in one word. Edgy. <laughs> uh, if you could meet anyone dead or alive that you haven't already, who would it be? Anthony Bourdain. And the proudest moment of your life so far? Oh, that's hard. <laughs> <laughs> um proudest moment of my life okay coming back from my injury and being called back to the national team oh, okay interesting and uh the happiest moment of your life would that be the same moment or happiest moment of my life was playing actually getting to play with the national team against venezuela and seeing my jersey oh, okay and your biggest strength hmm. <laughs> That was my biggest friend. My desire. <laughs> I'm very stubborn. <laughs> that's that is my <laughs> that's my strong point. <laughs> I'm very strong. Yeah, I'm stubborn. I, I go for what I want and I don't yeah. stop. Yeah. And the final question is describe yourself in three words. Um describe myself in three words. Um 
resilient. I'm extremely, I'm, I'm resilient. Yeah. Uh, I'm always laughing. <laughs> I'm, I'm always laughing. <laughs> Even when I'm nervous or like, like someone dies, I laugh. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm extremely giggly. Mm. And what's another way? <laughs> <laughs> this is hard. Uh. I'm strong. <laughs> that's, that's what my father is saying. <laughs> oh, I trust his opinion then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much, Chelsea, for coming on. I know it's been hard scheduling it about four or five times. So I'm yeah, glad. I'm, I'm so I've been a mess. Sorry. No, no, it's fine. I'm just glad we got to get it done. <laughs> Thank you guys for having me. No, thank, thank you so much. It's been a great episode. And thanks everyone for watching. And we will see you all on the next week's episode. So see you there. Bye. 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 Bye.